All right. In this module, we're going to learn how to create an iPad app, but also look at how we can adapt this iPad app to the iPhone. So we're going to learn how to do auto layout at the same time. We're also going to introduce text fields in this module as well, so learning how to deal with a text field or text entry and then getting getting that text field to go away. We're also going to introduce customized objects or custom classes and uh, of type NS object and being able to save data to a small object and retrieve data as well. So what we're going to do here is, and we're also going to look at the web kit view and learn how to get the activity indicator to display so that it displays a little loading indicator while the page is loading and then the load and then it'll go away. So what we're going to do is, uh, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have that indicator up and at them and then go away after afterwards. Also to demonstrate where it says name, we'll just type in like Jim Kirk and then have Jim at Kirk.com, hit go. We'll, have, we'll also talk about alert boxes, alert controllers, and, and what to do when you have a yes, no situation, like how can embed code to act upon clicking on yes. And in this case, update the labels below. And then you can see what it looks like on an iPhone 8, but it doesn't work like that right, off the, right out of the box. So we have to utilize auto layout to ensure that we get things to place nicely. So that's the goal for, for this application here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new project. All right, so we're gonna do file, new project. And we'll end up with iOS single V application again. And we'll call this one iPad auto layout. And we'll give it a home. So Swift is a language. So let's start off in launch screen storyboard. Just throw up a label that says loading. But before we do that, you notice that it says view as iPhone 8 down at the bottom. So what we want to do is we want to change that to look uh, at an iPad. So when we expand that, last, last uh, exercise we did, we switched from orientation portrait to landscape. We won't do that this time. This time we'll change the device. So you can see all the different devices available at your disposal. I click on this one. This one shows me the iPad Pro 9.7 inch. You look at the other devices, so those iPad 10.5 and iPad 12.9. So okay, iPad Pro 9.7 inch, that's good enough. And you can see that it looks like it's really blown up the, the view of it. So we can scale that down by pinching in and out on our trackpad. And that'd be good enough. On older X codes, if you pinched out too far like that, uh, dragging items over would not work for you. So for example, like if I want to drag like a label, right, it would just go away like that. Uh, you know, you had to actually zoom in to get something to display, right? So, but, but in newer Xcodes, uh, they allow us to do that now, which was really a big relief because you really needed a nice high res monitor to work with iPad storyboards. It was painful before. So anyway, let's drag over a label, and we dragged over this label, and you look at how the label looks, it's really small compared to a typical iPhone look and feel. So we're gonna have to really play with the font here. So you can see a 17 font comes out really small on this device, like when I zoom out, very difficult to see. So I'm just gonna put the word loading. Center it, increase the font around 50, that would be good enough. And that's good enough for launch screen. Now let's move over to main storyboard, and we'll do the same thing again. I'm just gonna switch that to be an iPad 9.7. Now I'm picky on the 9.7, but of course you have the 12 and you have the 10 to, to support as well, so auto layout can be your friend in that regard as well. So I'm just going to choose a label for our title. And I'll use 
a 50 font again as well. I'm just going to stretch it out more. Center it. Let's call it uh, My iPad App. And increase the font to, let's say, 50. And we'll reduce it down. I think 39 is good. Bring a couple more labels. I'm just going to copy and paste so it maintains the sizing. And give a bit of a gap. Push it further down. All right. Change this to be the text. My name. And this text will be my email. All right. So now in between, let's add some text boxes. So we type in the word text. We have two objects available at our disposal. There's text field and text view. So there's the main fundamental difference between the two is that text field will, will display one line of text or ena enable entry of one line of text. Text view is multi-line input. So yeah, you have, if you think that you just need one line, you go with text field. If you think you need more than one line, then you go with text field. So I'll just drag text field. But the thing is, you have to be very careful with these is that, and one very common mistake for beginners is that you you might drag one of these objects over, but then in your outlets, in your code, you'll declare the opposite one. And so when you come back to connect, they don't match up. So that's a common error amongst beginner programs. And, and I guess even veterans as well, it, it happens. So that's one error to watch out for. Now, I'll bring over two text fields for name and email, and let's explore what's there. So text can have some default text in there, but typically we're accustomed to having like placeholder text. And so we can use the placeholder text uh, place to type in enter name here. And for the next one, enter email here. Now we can play with the font. Let's center justify them both. And we can increase the font size as well. Now we're kind of limited, unfortunately, with the sizing because it cuts off. Now we got 22 there, 23 there. So we just make it consistent. So now we got our text fields here with a larger font to work with. Now let's explore a little bit more about what the text field's all about. So we have an option for a clear button. Right now it says never appears. We can say appears while editing, unless editing, always visible. So maybe I'll just do while editing. And then we can even check off this checkbox to say always clear the input when you begin editing. And we'll do the same for the second one. So while editing, when editing begins. Now let's see what's further down along here. Now text input traits is useful because you have content type, capitalization, correction. So capitalization, like words, sentences, capital them all. Content type, now what type of content are you entering in here? It allows you to help out with what data to uh, what data is being in entered. Correction, so autocorrect. Smart dashes, smart insert, spell checking. And then keyboard type, keyboard type is a useful one. So like, do you want numbers, punctuation, URL, number pad, phone pad, name, phone pad, email, and so on. So we'll leave it as default. Uh, return key is what I want to add in. So I'm going to choose done. So what is the return key going to look like? For email, I'm going to choose keyboard type will be email address. So at least we can see the at symbol there. And then return key will be done. All right. And so that allows us to configure the the text fields there. So we'll do our more tech configuring in, in code. 
We'll come back to this in a moment. Last thing, or one more thing we're going to add is a button. So I'm going to drag a button, stretch it out. Put the word go. Increase the font as well. All right. Now we have this whole empty space down here. So let's fill it up with a web view. Type in web. We have our deprecated web view. We're going to choose the brand new WebKit view. and stretch it out all the way. And, and let's add an activity indicator. So the activity indicator will be like a little loading type indicator there. Now it's very difficult to see and what's strange is you cannot stretch it out to resize despite having the squares there so it's very misleading. Instead we have to go to the top and configure it here in our attributes inspector. By default it's gray. We're going to change it to large white. Even on the iPhone I use large white as well just so it's visible. But also change the color to be more visible. I'm going to choose red so it really stands out. So now I have here an activity indicator on top of my WebKit view. And now this is sufficient for me to write some code and get started. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to declare all my variables. So I'm going to move over to viewcontroller.swift after I save the file with a command S. Let's look at viewcontroller.swift. So let's declare our variables. And we'll start with IB outlet, var web view extends WK web view. But it's going to give us an error because it doesn't know what this is. So that means we have to import WebKit in order to make it go away. Then we'll say IB outlet, var activity which extends UI activity indicator view. Now let's declare our text field. So we'll say IB outlet var TF name extends UI text field and IB outlet var TF email extends UI text field. Now be careful here because if you drag text views over, you want to say UI text view. And a common mistake is interchanging the wrong data type. So if it's a text field, it's a text field. It's a text view, it's a text view. Make sure you choose the right one. Now let's add in a couple of labels. So IB outlet, var, LB name, extends UI label and IB outlet var LB email sometimes autocorrect's not your best friend so LB email UI label all right so I have all my variables done up here so now what we're going to do is we're going to get the web view up and running or webkit view up and running. So we brought in webkit. Now to be able to get the special support methods we need for the for starting and stopping the activity indicator, we have to bring in a protocol. So we're going to say class view controller extends UI view controller comma wk navigation delegate. Then that allows us access to a couple of support methods. But first thing we're going to do is just get a website to display. So what we'll do is under view to load, 
we're going to say let URL address. So there are four steps now to getting a web page to display. First thing is to declare this object, and we're going to call it URL address of type URL, where we specify our URL. So string, we'll say https colon slash slash www.projectmkd.com. It has to be an HTTP site, HTTPS site, sorry, because uh, HTTP sites are blocked out unless you manually open a security hole to enable visibility of HTTP URLs. So first step, declare the URL object to specify our website. Next step, we'll declare our URL request object. So let URL equal URL request. And we'll pass in URL, which will just be our URL address object. And it's going to complain. Wants us to specify an optional type. Let's go with what it suggests to make it easy. Third step, tell our web view to load. And so we'll pass in URL. Now it's going to complain. It wants an optional type as well. So last step is to add in an additional step that didn't exist in the web view world. And in fact, you had to ma manually do this in the storyboard, but we're going to specify the delegate. So we'll say web view dot navigation delegate equals self. All right. So those four lines will get a web view to display. Now, what we want to do is we want to get the two support methods up and running to get our web view to display the activity indicator. So I'm going to add it just above view did load. So the first support method is called did start provisional navigation. And inside of it, I'm just going to unhide the activity indicator. So we'll say activity dot is hidden is equal to false. And activity dot start animating. And the other support method will execute upon finishing. So we call it did finish. So we're going to do the opposite above of above. So we'll say activity dot is hidden is equal to true activity dot stop animating. So now, at this point, we have the two support methods to get the activity indicator to start and stop. Now, when we type in load, when this code, line of code gets executed, it kicks in this method, did start provisional navigation. So, the, uh, so while the web server is making the request and down, we're downloading the, the web pages to the web view, this is act actively happening. So is hidden is false, start animating. And then once the page has rendered in the web view, so the page is loaded and it's done, did finish kicks in. And we do is hidden is true, stop animating. So between these methods, you have, your, you have enough to get your iPad to display a web view and a web page inside that web view. Now let's switch over to main storyboard. And let's connect things up. So I'm going to click on the yellow circle and go to my connections inspector and I see a whole bunch of stuff. So we're going to connect activity. Now you have very careful to connect the activity because if I drag it, you see how it wants to connect to the web view? Well, we don't want to connect it there. In fact, we want to connect it only to the web, to the activity indicator. So be very careful of that. It must only connect to the activity indicator. Otherwise it'll cause a crash. And the web view, just going to the last one, must connect only to the gray space, the web view. So you should just see web view here and activity here. So you're very careful of that. If you get an app crash, check here. Now the other stuff, LB email to my email, LB name to my name, TF email to that text field, and TF name to that name. Well, let's just run it and let's make sure our web website appears. Now, don't forget to choose 
iPad Pro 9.7 inch. loading and now it's spinning and spinning and eventually there it is the website is starting to load it's got its loading indicator I have my loading indicator and it's gone so now we have our web view All right so now we have our web view So now, the next step is to get the text field to work. But before we do that, let's have a look at it. So I'm going to try entering some information here. If you, By the way, if you don't see your keyboard, if you see this little bar, you can get the keyboard to display by going to Hardware, Keyboard, Toggle Software Keyboard, and you'll notice that the shortcut key is Command-K. So you can do a command K as well to get it to hide and unhide. Now the thing is a simulator, because we're using our keyboards on the on the laptop or the desktop here that we're typing off of, will after a while say, okay, I know you don't need you're using your own keyboard, so I won't even bother showing the keyboard. So it that's why the keyboard here uh, appears and doesn't appear. So if I type like Jim Kirk, it actually went away again. So let me do a command K. All right. Now if I hit done nothing happens like we want the keyboard to be able to go away right clicking away doesn't do anything either right we want it to go away so we need to be able to add some functionality to get the keyboard to go away so what we're gonna do is go back to viewcontroller.swift and we're gonna add another delegate here another protocol so we have here class view controller extends UI view controller comma WK navigation delegate comma UI text field delegate. No need to import anything. This is built into the core language. So we're already there. So we have UI text field delegate. Now, once we bring that in, there's a support method we can bring in to get the keyboard to go away. So if I type in text field, Text field should return is what we need, but let's look at the other methods like text field did end editing, text field did begin editing. So these get kicked in once you start editing and once you're done editing your text field. So you can add some functionality there. Text field should clear, should end editing, should begin editing. There's a bunch of different text field support methods. The most common one that we need is to get the keyboard to go away. So we're going to choose text field should return. And we're just going to say return text field dot resign first responder so that support method will get the keyboard to go away so now let's move over to the storyboard and connect things up so we'll click on main storyboard and we'll I'll bring back all of my right-handed views there. Click on the yellow circle for view controller. Now this time, let's click on the text field. So click on the name text field. And you see there's a thing called delegate there. It has an empty circle. So mouse over that, let it turn to a plus. Click and drag to the yellow circle. And we'll do the same thing for email. Click on the email text field. Mouse over to delegate. Drag delegates empty circle as it turns into a plus sign over to the yellow circle. What this does is it actually invokes the keyboard method, support method we just created, text field should return. So it basically tells the view controller, look inside yourself to find text field should return or any of the text field support methods that are available inside UI text field delegate. So we're gonna give it a run and test things out. So it's loading. And now what we'll do is we'll click on, so we're letting it load. We're letting the load page load first. We see there's Walla there at the bottom, and we have Monkey Kiss and Donkey 2's homepage. But if I click on 
the text field, type in Jim Kirk, hit the go button, keyboard goes away. Click on the email, let's put jim at kirk.com, click on done, and the keyboard goes away. So we now have keyboard uh, ability to make the keyboard go away. Now, maybe sometimes, just as a note, you may not see the keyboard because you've entered in enough stuff uh, already too often. And so what we want to do is uh, do Command K to get the keyboard to go away. All right. Now the next step is to get the Go button up and running. So we're going to hit Stop, and we're going to get the Go button up and running. What we're going to do, though, with the Go button is have an alert box pop up to verify, hey, are you sure you want to save this information? So uh, we'll have yes and no. So we did text alert uh, alert boxes in the past already, but we are going to this time actually add some event handling code for the alert box to determine yes or no. So first thing we'll do is create an IB action. We'll call it update labels, and we'll say sender is any. And so now we're going to go again through the four steps to getting alert box to appear. So, first thing to do is to type in let alert controller equal UI alert controller. We'll call it alert. We'll take that third method stub there, and it'll have title, message, and preferred style. So title will be warning. And message will be, are you sure you want to do this? Oops, I'll fix that typing again with a question mark. And preferred style. So we'll choose dot alert as opposed to its other option, which is action sheet. So we'll type in dot alert. We'll add some spaces. We'll add in our two alert buttons, or buttons to support the alert controller. So we'll say let yes action equal UI alert action. Choose the only method stub available to us there. And we'll say title will be yes, style will be dot default, and handler will be We'll set handler to be nil for now. We'll fill in the blanks afterwards. Now we'll do let no action equal UI alert action. Again, choose the only method stub there. We'll put the word no for the title. Style will be dot cancel. We need at least one dot cancel in there. Well, handler is nil. So the no action will definitely not do anything. And then finally, We'll join the two actions we created to the alert box. So we'll say alert dot add action for yes action. And we'll say alert dot add action for no action. And then finally, let's get the alert box to display. So we'll say present alert and We'll say animated is true. So comma animated is true. Give a little bit of a animation to it. So now we have our, our alert box that displays an event handler called update labels. So now we need to switch back to main storyboard and connect up our alert our our go button to our update labels event handler. So we'll switch back to main storyboard, click on the yellow circle, bring up our connections inspector. At the bottom of the list, we have our event handler update labels with sender. Just going to connect that up to the go button and choose touch up inside, which means upon letting go of the button, anywhere inside of the button, 
will execute the event handler. So now we'll run it. All right. So it's loading the web page. Now if I type in Jim Kirk, Jim at Kirk.com, and I hit go, it says warning, are you sure? I'll hit yes, nothing will happen. I'll hit go. Warning, are you sure? Nothing will happen because I thought no. So there you go. Now we've got the alert box to display. So now, now that we've got the alert box to display, the next step is to get the data that we have here to display in the labels. But I'm going to take an ex extra step, a step here and create a custom object and show you how to create a custom object so that you can save your data there. So I'm just going to add a new object here. So I'll right click and say new file. It'll be an iOS Cocoa Touch class. And it's going to be a type NS object. I'm going to call it data. and give it a home. Okay, so we got here class data extends NS object. Now we're going to save name and email here. That's the whole purpose of it. We're going to use a we're going to talk about how to create a constructor, what constructors are about here as well. So let's create a couple of variables. So we'll say var saved name extends string var saved email extends string as well. And let's create a constructor. So all constructors use the keyword init. All right. So init, and if it's a Specialized constructor would be like init with data, init with stuff, init with food, init with, uh, init with transaction, whatever you want. And you'll see Apple code all through will use init with something to be more detailed, descriptive about the constructor it is defining here. So I'm going to start with init. Sorry, we'll say func init with stuff. Pass in our first argument, so we'll say the name will be of type string, the email will be of type string as well. And we'll just save saved name equals the name, saved email will be the email. Now let's add that default constructor that we have. Maybe we'll default some values. So we'll say init, hit enter, it comes up with override init. So override says it's going to override the base class's method value with this uh, with this method. So we'll just hard code, we'll say saved name equals Jim Kirk and saved email equals Jim at Kirk.com. Overall, we have here our object that we're going to use to save our data. So now, let's finish off our, our saving of data. So we'll return back to viewcontroller.swift. We're going to create another method just above update labels to support what we're doing here. So we're going to say func and call it do the update. No arguments passed in. All I'm going to do is I'm going to instantiate the data object. So I'll say let data, which extends data, equal dot init, which is called the base constructor. Data dot init with stuff. We'll pass in tf name dot text tf email dot text and it'll give us a bit of an error message here it wants us to provide some optionals so let's just 
let it choose which optionals to put. So for name, it wants exclamation mark. For email, it also wants exclamation mark. And then finally, let's populate our labels. So we'll say LB name dot text equals data dot saved name. And then LB email dot text equals data dot saved email. Now, of course, looking at this code, it's like a long-winded implementation of just taking data and re regurgitating it onto labels. But the whole purpose of this method was just to illustrate how we can use a custom object to save. Maybe the real step should have been here to save it to an array. So you have passed input, and then from there, redisplay the data from, from the array using a table view, which will be taught further down the road. But for now, just to illustrate how objects are, custom objects are used, uh, this is the way you would approach it. So we have this method do the update. Now what we want to do is we want to be able to call it inside our alert box. And in particular, we want to tie it in to our yes button for our alert box. So it's going to scroll down to where we have yes action. And we're going to embed it inside yes action. Now we're going to replace handler, handler's value, with the code we need to support this action here. So I'm going to take out handler, and I'm going to hit enter, add some extra space so it's readable for, for you guys. And I'm going to open up a set of curlies. So I'm going to open up a curly brace and close it off down here. Now we're going to choose something called block coding. So block coding in Apple languages is used to embed code within code, so to wrap it around. We've seen it in other languages as well, but it's called block coding here. So first thing you do is you don't write the word func, you don't write a method name, you just jump right into the arguments that are passed in. So we're going to open up a set of round brackets, and we're going to specify an argument to be passed in to this piece of block code. So, and, and typically the method you are using will specify the arguments they want passed in in these round brackets. So look into the method stub definition uh, of handler as you type in a new alert action, you'll see the exact same thing. So I'm just going to copy it out. So it says alert of type UI alert action with an exclamation mark. You type in the word in, which says begin your, which is basically begin your, your code. So all I want to do is say do the update. And really, that will be it. But it's going to complain. It's going to say, well, no, no, do the update exists outside of this of this uh, area so we have to actually say self dot do the update now this would normally be enough to execute but when you get into block coding like this you have to manually tell the tell the alert box to go away so we actually have to say one more line of code here which is self dot dismiss animated will say true completion handler so you kind of seeing here I could have a completion handler with a piece of block code here. In this case, the piece of block code has no arguments inside its round brackets and has a void for return, so basically no need for the void. And then from there on this side, the, for the question mark, you just put in the code you need for the completion handler. But in our case, we'll just say no. All right, so now you can give it a run, and you should see your labels update. So there you go, we got Jim Kirk, jimmckirk.com. Now, at this point, we've got our keyboard up and running. We've got, we're saving our data. We're, we've learned how to get our, uh, our data to display. We learned how to embed some code within the alert box. As on top of getting our web view to display a web page with an activity indicator as feedback. Now, let's see this app support, supported on the iPhone 8, for example, so on a different device. So now we need to be able to support our look and feel on different devices. Well, a good way to test out is to run this on a different device. So I'm going to call up the iPhone 8, and let's see what happens here. Okay, and let's see here. So the iPad look and feel is kind of over overshadowing our iPhone 8 and preventing us from having a nice look and feel for our our app here. You can kind of see the web view is cut off there at the bottom. So we need to adapt our design and auto layout to to 
enable this to display properly on an iPhone, right? So it will support all the devices and make sure that things are placed properly. But we also need to maybe pick and choose what we can and can't display here. Like having a web view at the bottom of the screen kind of won't work for us because it's going to be so tiny, there's no point. So there's ability to control code in Swift and, and Objective-C as well that'll allow us to uh, to selectively execute code depending on the device we're on. So if we're on an iPad, we'll execute code for that iPad. If we're on an iPhone, we'll execute code for that iPhone. All right. So to do that, let's first start off with not having the web view dis uh, execute or display upon uh, on an iPhone. So any iPhone device. So what we'll do is we'll stop this. I'm going to switch back to view controller that Swift. Let's go back to view to load. And this set of code all relates to the web view. So what we're going to do is we're going to hide this inside uh, for we're going to hide this for iPhones and we're going to display it for iPads. So we're going to say if UI device dot current dot user interface idiom equals dot pad. Now, before I even finish that, there are actually four options here I want to show you. So I've hit dot, there's CarPlay for Apple CarPlay, pad for iPad, phone for iPhone, and TV for Apple TV, and there's also unspecified. So we're going to choose pad. So we want to only execute this code for iPads. All right, so we only want a website to display for iPads. Otherwise, let's hide this. So we'll say else. We'll say web view dot is hidden is true. Activity dot is hidden is true. So now, if we run it again, we should see no web view. So there you go, the web view has gone away. So now, let's look at getting everything to display nicely for an iPhone. So now we're going to introduce auto layout. And for auto layout, there's really no coding involved here. It's all about working with the storyboard. So it, dis it works on this constraint methodology here, where you're going to add constraints to your objects on the screen to be able to move things accordingly. Now, the challenge with learning auto layout is that it depends on the on your design. So you actually have to sort of play around with it and really understand what's going on in order to be able to ensure that you get the best experience here. So what we're going to do here is we want to start off with, let's say, our label at the top and define some constraints for it. Well, we want to have it centered all the time in the middle of any screen that it appears. So to do that, there's this little TIE fighter here. I call it a TIE fighter. If I mouse over, it says add new constraints. If I click on that, this menu comes up. This allows me to specify different values for uh, positioning this item. So uh, maybe I'm going to have this item always be 20 pixels below the top. And on each side, let's set it so there's only 20 pixels on each side. And then we'll hit add three constraints. It actually moved it around and added these blue lines. Blue lines are good because they say, okay, the constraints are good. We're happy with them. If they're red or orange, they're not good because it has issues with what you've done. And so once you, once you get an issue, it gets really messy in terms of how to undo it. Now, in, if you entered some constraints, and you don't like them. There's two areas where you can edit them. So you can expand your document view here, go to constraints and look for 
the constraints you introduce. That's the first place you can look. Or second place you can look is in your sizing inspector. So highlighting the label, go to size inspector and scroll down. Your constraints are right here. You can click on edit to edit those values. So let's give this a run now. Let's see what it looks like on an iPhone 8. So we see that my iPad app has centered nicely. So now let's see if we can apply this to the other other items on the screen. So now let's look at the text field for enter name here. Let's click on do the same thing. So now this is saying we can put a 52 pixels below, but maybe that's too far down for an iPhone. So let's say, you know, we do uh, 40 pixels. Now when it's saying it's it's spacing to nearest neighbor, like it says here, ne nearest neighbor in this case is this label. Over here, maybe, and I'll show you what, if we introduce something, let's introduce an issue here. Let's say that I want 200 pixels on each side. And I hit add three constraints. Now, it looks fine on the iPad. Let's see what it looks like on the iPhone. All right. Your text field for name has disappeared. So it doesn't like that. So let's go with the same 20 pixel mentality because the, the iPhone 8 is obviously a smaller screen than the iPad. So we need to adjust these constraints. So making sure the text field's highlighted, scroll down, go to our 200 and 200 and change those down to 20. Right, and you can see it's readjusted itself, run it again. So now it's placing itself nicely here. Now let's do the same for email. So we'll add in constraints there. So we'll say, I'll say it's like 20 below and then 20 on each end. All right, the go button, the go button will be interesting because it's a small square. So if, if I keep each, each of these, so 299, 299, and just say, we'll say seven, add two constraints. There's an issue there. Let's see what the issue is. It needs a Y position. So let's see if we can, maybe there's a fix for it. Add missing constraint. That just introduced a whole bunch of problems there. So let's delete that and start again. Sometimes just starting again with your constraints is the best way to go. So So I'm just going to take these out. All right, so let's see here. So as you can see, auto layout is not an easy area to work with. Let's just start again. So we'll say that we are 10 pixels below add one constraint at a time. Okay. Let's take out that constraint then. Maybe our best bet is to go similar to what we had before. So if we go 20 above, we go let's say 100 on each side. And we hit add three constraints. That seems okay. 
So I like that. Let's just run and see what we got so far. All right, so the go button is fine. Now let's finish off the last two items. So same idea. 25, we'll do two, 20 on each side. There we go. And so now everything centers nicely on the iPhone. And you can run it again to test it on the iPad to see what it looks like. And you should see everything in order for both devices. So there you go. That's what it looks like on the iPad compared to the iPhone. Now, one last thing to talk about are the different options. So we just we just went with some simple, simple constraints here because it's very tough to get started. You just start off simple. Other things to look at, aspect ratio, width and height. Those are useful. I, I think they're useful for images especially. So maybe you have an image, you want to maintain a certain aspect ratio for that image, but maybe resize it as you, as the, as you use different devices. So aspect ratio is a good one for images. And there's also this one centering horizontally in container or vertically in container. So if you want to make sure your item is centered all the time, this is a good way to go as well. So that's another option. But okay, so looking at our application, it's complete. So let's cover, let's talk about again what we covered. So we covered how to do an iPad app, how to get a web view to display with an activity indicator, how to get a text field to display and also get the keyboard to go away, how to create a custom class, of type NS object, how to instantiate it, how to create a constructor, how to create an alert box, and then embed some code in the in one of the buttons for the alert box, and finally how to resize using auto layout for different devices. So we supported an iPhone 8 and an iPad 9.7 inch.